This is the start of chapter 14 about ethers, epoxides, and thiols. So um, when we talked about alkanes, we mentioned that they were relatively inert. and They're not particularly reactive, which is why we often use alkanes as solvents. Um, they don't have much of a dipole moment, um, and so they don't react with many species, and so that makes them good solvents. A good solvent should not react. Uh, ethers are similar. Um, ethers are more reactive than alkanes, but they're much less reactive than alcohols, for example. Uh, and so we often see ethers being used as solvents and not very often as reactants. Um, here we can see uh, a comparison of the boiling point of alcohols and alkanes and ethers um, as a function of their polarity. So uh, water being highly polar because it has two oxygen-hydrogen bonds, which allows it to engage in hydrogen bonding. Um, ethanol has one oxygen-hydrogen bond, so still fairly polar, however not as polar as water, so its boiling point has dropped to 78. Um, and then we see um, ethers of similar molecular weight. So for example, if we compare ethanol and dimethyl ether, we see that the ether has a far lower boiling point, and that's because we have removed the oxygen-hydrogen bond, and therefore it's no longer capable of hydrogen bonding with itself. So the um, major intermolecular force in ethers is dipole-dipole, uh, and that makes the boiling point go down significantly. Um, we can compare that to a similar molecular weight alkane, like propane, and we see that propane doesn't have hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole. It only has Van der Waals forces uh, as the primary intermolecular force. So that drops the boiling point even lower. So again, alcohols capable of hydrogen bonding. Ethers are not capable of hydrogen bonding with each other. So uh, remember, a hydrogen bond requires two components. It requires a hydrogen bond donor which is the um, electronegative atom that's bonded to H, either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And it also requires a hydrogen bond acceptor, which is a lone pair of electrons on a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So um, ethers don't have any hydrogen bond donors because they don't have, there aren't any OH bonds in an ether. There's only oxygen carbon bonds. Uh, so what we can see in this graph here is that ethers are not capable of hydrogen bonding with themselves. However, e ethers do have hydrogen bond acceptors because they have a, two pairs of uh, electrons on the oxygen atom. So if we put an, uh, an ether and an alcohol together, the alcohol can supply the, can be the hydrogen bond donor and the ether can be the hydrogen bond acceptor. So they are capable of hydrogen bonding with other types of compounds that provide the donor, um, they are just not capable of hydrogen bonding with each other. So if we have a pure ether with nothing else in solution, then the boiling point is generally pretty low because they are incapable of hydrogen bonding. Um, moving on to the, the nomenclature of ethers, um, I, I've mentioned before that we generally use the IUPAC naming system when we're naming most functional groups, most organic molecules use IUPAC nomenclature. Uh, however, there are a couple of cases where the common name is preferred over the IUPAC name, and ethers are one of those examples. So um, ethers are always, in the IUPAC system, ethers are always branches. So we would look for the longest chain, like we always do when we're doing IUPAC nomenclature. If we look at this first example, the longest continuous chain of carbons is two carbons. We have one carbon on the left side of the oxygen and two carbons on the right side of the oxygen. So that longest chain is going to be a two carbon chain, which we would call ethane, since it doesn't have any double or triple bonds. It's an alkane. Um, and then bonded to the first carbon of that two carbon chain is a an oxygen bonded to a methyl group, which we would call methoxy. So the IUPAC name of that first 
ether is methoxy ethane, and we treat that methoxy piece as a branch on the ethane chain. Um, however, it's more common, you'll see that more often that ethers are named by naming the, the two halves of the ether. If we look at an ether, we can um, imagine that the oxygen kind of separates it into two distinct components. So on the left side of the oxygen atom, we have one carbon, so we call that methyl. And on the other side of the uh, oxygen, we have two carbons, we call that ethyl. So we would uh, alphabetize the ethyl first before the methyl, and we would end up calling that ethyl methyl ether. And so we would name the two halves of the ether separately and name it as if it's an ether. This is generally more common than using the IUPAC name. Notice that the word ether does not appear in the IUPAC name, even though we would call this functional group an ether. So we often use the common name to name ethers instead. The second example here, we have um, a methyl on one side of the oxygen and we have a phenyl group on the other side of the oxygen. So the common name, we would call this methyl phenyl ether. Uh, the IUPAC name would look for the longest continuous chain of carbons, which in this case is six carbons. And so um, that would be that benzene ring, but we would, uh, um, so it would be benzene in terms of IUPAC. And then uh, the other branch would be methoxy. So we'd have a methoxy branch on a benzene ring. So we'd call that methoxy benzene. Um, moving on to the third example, we have uh, both carbon chains are the same length on either side of that oxygen. We have one carbon on the right side, we have one carbon on the left side. Um, the carbon on the left also has a chlorine on it, and so we would um, call, we would, the, the base of this would be a methane, because both sides have one carbon, so they're both methane, um, but the one on the left being bonded to a chlorine, we would uh, call that a branch on that methane chain and so we would name the, the carbon as a methyl the chlorine would be a chloro and since that it's bonded to an oxygen it would be a methoxy so a chloro methoxy methane is the IUPAC name but again that's uncommon for us to use that IUPAC name when we're talking about ethers we, you'll more often see it named using the common nomenclature so we call that one chloro methyl methyl ether. Um, some ethers are too complicated for us to use the common name. So for example, when we look at the, the three examples on the bottom here, um, it's unclear how we would name one half because it's a very complicated half. For example, the, the first one with the cyclohexane ring, we see that there's an oxygen and on one side of the oxygen is ethyl, so there's two carbons. On the other side is a cyclohexane ring with two methyl groups bonded to the cyclohexane ring in a specific position. So that's too hard for us to name. It's too complicated for us to break this into two halves and use a common name. So in really complicated examples of ethers like this, we're, we're forced to use the IUPAC name. So in this case, we want to uh, treat it as an alkane, so we want to minimize the numbers on the branches. That's essentially what we're doing here. And so if we name, if we start the numbering on the cyclohexane ring where those methyl groups are, then that would be carbon 1, and we would move the numbering clockwise until we get to the carbon where the ethoxy group is. An ethoxy is just an ethyl with an oxygen, so we call it ethoxy. So we'd have one 1-dimethyl, one and we'd have a 3-ethoxy. And then when we alphabetize these, remember that the di does not count for when we're doing the alphabetical order. So we would that one would start with an M because it's a methyl, and the other one is ethoxy, so the E comes before the M. So we would num name this one 3-ethoxy, 1-1-dimethylcyclohexane. Um, moving on to the next. We see where the oxygen is, and on one side of the oxygen is a methyl group, and on the other side of the oxygen is this complicated cyclobutane ring. And so we have to use IUPAC nomenclature here because it doesn't have a simple name. We can't use common name here. 
And so we're going to treat this as an alkane. A cyclobutane would be the base here. Um, and again, we want to uh, minimize the numbers on the branches. And so for this one, whether we number the chlorine 1 and the methoxy 2, or the methoxy 1 and the chlorine 2, the numbers are 1 and 2 both ways. So how do we know if it's 1 chloro or 1 methoxy? Whenever I have a tie like that, and I can num number it either way to get the same numbers, then we're going to give the, the branch that is alphabetically first is going to get the lowest number. So that's why this one is 1 chloro, 2 methoxy cyclobutane. And notice there's stereochemistry indicated here. We have a, a wedge on the chlorine group and a dash on the methoxy group. So that is a trans relationship. So we would call this one trans 1-chloro 2-methoxy cyclobutane. We could also um, utilize the R and S nomenclature here, and we could determine whether those stereocenters are in the R or S configuration and name it using that system too. So trans or R and S. Um, finally, we get to this third example here where we have um, an ethyl group on one side, and so we would have ethyl, and on the other side we have um, an ethyl group and a, an alcohol. So when we looked at the table that uh, compares the priority of the different functional groups, we saw that alcohol has a higher priority than an alkane. So the base name for this compound would be alcohol. We would, we would prioritize that ethyl branch with the OH above the other ethyl branch. So we would, the ethyl branch would, the, the carbon that's bonded to the OH would be carbon one, because since alcohol has a high priority, that one gets the lowest number. And then carbon two has this branch on it, which is oxygen with two carbons, and we would call that ethoxy. So this would be two ethoxy ethanol. Okay, moving on to synthesis. We just saw this uh, reaction in the previous chapter where we can deprotonate an alcohol using the appropriate base, which will give us an alkoxide ion. And that alkoxide ion is a strong nucleophile that can participate in SN2 reactions. So if we use an alkoxide and a primary alkyl halide, then we can create an ether. Using, this is called the Williamson ether synthesis. Remember a couple of things to, uh, to consider when we're doing this reaction. The alkyl halide must be primary. If it's secondary, we're in competition with an elimination reaction, so we might get an alkene instead of an ether. And if it's tertiary, it will definitely be an elimination reaction. It would be an E2 mechanism, and so we wouldn't get any substitution product if it was a tertiary alkyl halide. So we have to use a primary alkyl halide when we do the Williamson ether synthesis in order to get a good yield. So the reaction below shows that we can start with an alcohol, cyclohexanol in this case, and in the first step we can utilize sodium metal, and sodium metal will deprotonate that alcohol and turn it into a strong nucleophile. And in the second step we can add the appropriate uh, electrophile which in this case is a tosylated um, ethyl group, right? We have the, the ethyl group with that tosyl on it. And remember, we can treat that OTS as if it's a halogen, because once we have an OTS, that's a weak base as a leaving group. It's a really good leaving group, that tosylated alcohol. And so treating in that second step, we have ethyl tosylate, but it could just as easily be ethyl bromide or ethyl iodide because they're all good leaving groups. So then our uh, alkoxide that we created after the first step would attack the electrophilic carbon on that tosylate ion, and we would form an ether. In this case, ethoxy cyclohexane. So as I just mentioned, the, the electrophile component, whether it's an alkyl halide or a tosylate or some other group that's a good leaving group, it has to be primary. So the first reaction shows that if we use our alkoxide ion and we um, attack a tertiary alkyl halide, tert-butyl bromide in this case, we don't get an ether 
because this would be in competition. This would be purely E2 as a with a strong base and a tertiary substrate. The mechanism is is primarily E2. We wouldn't get any substitution product from this, or if a, a very 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 small amount. So this would not be the appropriate way to make tert butyl propyl ether. Um, we would see as in the reaction below that instead what would happen is our uh, alkoxide would react as a base instead of a nucleophile and it would initiate an E2 mechanism which would give us an alkene, isobutylene in this case. So if we wanted to make tert butyl propyl ether this would not be the appropriate way to do it. However, notice that an ether has two halves. So the two halves in the ether that we're looking at here, we have the tert butyl on one side of the oxygen, and we have the propyl on the other side of the oxygen. That propyl group, our alkoxide, is actually primary, right? Where that oxygen is bonded to the propyl chain, that's a primary carbon. Um, so what we could do in this case is just swap the oxygen and the bromine. If we make the nucleophile tert butoxide, and we put the oxygen on that tert butyl group, and we put the bromine on the other group, so we'd have propyl bromide, that would actually give us a good yield of that ether because we'd have a primary substrate. The electrophile would be primary. So in this case, we have a primary, the, the one that's shown, we have a primary nucleophile, but a tertiary electrophile. So we would just swap the oxygen and the bromine. Then we'd have a primary electrophile and a tertiary nucleophile. Now we did say before that that tertiary nucleophile is not a very good nucleophile because it's so bulky. But because our electrophile is primary in this case, it does actually give us a good yield of the substitution product. Because remember, E2 mechanism does not occur on a primary substrate. Uh, or if again, if it does, it's to a very small extent. So our primary product in that case with a main product, major product, would be the substitution product. So we could get tert butyl propyl ether, we just have to swap the oxygen and the bromine. So we show that here. If we put the oxygen, right, the, the way that, it, that we had it arranged on top does not work. That's an E2 mechanism. But if I swap the oxygen and the bromine, as shown down below, we do get a substitution product. We could make that ether we just have to make sure that the two halves, our nucleophile and our electrophile, are appropriately selected in this case. So the substrate must be methyl or primary. If it's secondary, we'll be in competition with E2, and if it's tertiary, it will be only E2. We won't get any substitution product. So that's an important thing to remember when we're performing the Williamson ether synthesis. We always have a choice about which half is going to be the nucleophile and which half is going to be the electrophile, and we always have to choose the lower substitution to be the uh, electrophile. Okay, um, on to another way to synthesize ethers. Um, this is oxymercuration, demercuration. We saw this when we were making alcohols. This is a Markovnikov reaction. It gives us Markovnikov regiochemistry, which puts the OH group on the more substituted carbon and the H on the lower substituted carbon. Um, if we use water in this reaction, we end up with an alcohol. If we use uh, an alcohol in this reaction, then we actually end up with an ether instead. So notice that um, we're using oxymercuration in this case, and that's going to, the mechanism is the same. Basically, if we look at the, this first step, we have ROH underneath the arrow, so that's going to be our nucleophile in this case. When we use water, it's just HOH, and then we would get an alcohol instead. But if we use uh, an alcohol as our substrate, so ROH, then that leaves us with an ether instead. So when we use this reaction to synthesize alcohols. We call it oxymercuration, demercuration. But if we use this reaction to synthesize um, ethers, we call it alkoxymercuration, demercuration, because we're using um, an, an alkoxide or an alcohol instead of water. But otherwise, the, re the reaction is the same. It's still Markovnikov regiochemistry. Um, we still need two steps, and in the second step is a reducing step, and we use sodium borohydride to remove that 
Mercury group. Um, this is another reaction that we saw in the previous chapter um, by molecular condensation, whereby we take two molecules of alcohol and a catalytic amount of acid, and the um, one of the alcohols will be protonated by the acid, which makes that OH into a good leaving group, and the other alcohol will serve as the nucleophile. So we can have two alcohol molecules attack each other as long as one of them is protonated and turns that OH into an H2O, into a good leaving group. So um, we, this is the same reaction that we saw in the last chapter. We're just looking at it now from the perspective of ethers instead of alcohols. Uh, if we take two molecules of that alcohol and catalytic amount of sulfuric acid, then we can have a condensation where this, whereby those two molecules condense into one molecule and we end up synthesizing dimethyl ether. Okay, so these are all reactions that we've seen before. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this chapter, we're just kind of looking at reactions we've already seen, but now we're looking at them from the perspective of ethers. So we're taking all of those reactions we've seen in different chapters, putting them together in the same place, and showing how we can synthesize different ways to synthesize ethers. So that first one is the Williamson ether synthesis. Um, the second is alkoxy mercuration demercuration. And the third way we've seen to synthesize ethers is this bimolecular condensation of alcohols. So there are two ways that we can synthesize ethers from an alcohol starting material, the Williamson or bimolecular condensation. And there's one mechanism here where we can synthesize ethers starting from an alkene. Okay, so uh, just like in the previous chapter, we first focus on ways that we can synthesize that functional group and then the next part of the chapter is focusing on what we can do with that functional group now that we have synthesized it. So for example, um, if we have an ether, then we can turn that ether into an alkyl halide. Uh, the way that we do this is exactly the same as we did when we used um, alcohol. Remember in the last chapter, we could start with an alcohol starting material and treat it with uh, a hydrohalic acid like hydrogen, like uh, hydrochloric acid or hydrobromic acid or hydroiodic acid. And the first step would be protonating the alcohol to turn it into a good leaving group. And the second step requires that nucleophile, the bromide or iodide or chloride, attacking our protonated alcohol. Well, if we start with an ether, it's the exact same reaction. If we can um, protonate that ether in the first step. So we would just protonate the oxygen in the first step of the reaction, breaking the bond between the hydrogen and the halogen. And in the second step, that free halide ion is a strong nucleophile that can attack either half of the ether. So in the case of alcohols, our leaving group becomes water. But in the case of ethers, our leaving group becomes an alcohol. Because we'll see in the next slide when we look at the mechanism, um, we have carbons on both sides of the oxygen. So after that first step, after we protonate that oxygen in the first step, it doesn't matter which carbon gets attacked. They're both electrophilic at that point. So here's what I mean. The first step is protonating the ether. Um, the second step involves our halogen, our halide ion, attacking either side of the protonated ether. And when that happens, the bond between the carbon and the oxygen and the ether breaks. So after that second step there, we get one equivalent of alkyl halide uh, because the X has attacked the, our, our nucleophile, the bromide, if we're imagining this is HBr. The bromide has attacked the carbon and broken that bond. So our leaving group in this case is an alcohol. So now that we have an alcohol, then the mechanism proceeds just like it did in the last chapter. The next step in the mechanism is protonating that alcohol with another equivalent of HBr, and then the bromide attacks that carbon atom, and water is our leaving group. So at the end of this reaction, when we cleave ethers by using HBr or HI, 
we end up with two equivalents of alkyl halide, and depending on whether our ether was symmetric or asymmetric, we'll either get two equivalents of the same alkyl halide, if both halves of the ether were the same, or we, we will get two alkyl halides that are different depending on the two halves of the ether that we started with. So uh, the one time that this is different um, is if we start with one half of our ether is a benzene ring or a phenyl group because what's going to happen in this case, the first step is the same. We protonate the ether, we release the bromide ion, that bromide ion is going to attack uh, the, the side of the ether that's not a benzene ring, and that's going to release our alcohol. But in this case, the alcohol that's released is a, a phenyl group, or excuse me, a phenol, and that's benzene that has an OH, a hydroxy, on it. Um, notice that we have to attack the side of the ether that is not benzene because the side of the ether that is benzene is an sp2 hybridized carbon and that sp2 hybridized carbon cannot undergo an sn2 reaction it has to be sp3 hybridized only one half of that group is sp3 hybridized in this case uh, and so only the half that's sp3 hybridized can get attacked by the bromide ion which is going to release phenol and then once phenol has been released it can't react any further. It is stable at this point. So even if we protonate phenol with another equivalent of HBr like we did in the last slide, the bromide cannot attack that sp2 hybridized carbon and turn phenol into a bromobenzene, for example. So it says here with phenol there's no further reaction. So when we use phenol as, as a leaving group, we only get one equivalent of alkyl halide and the phenol is going to stay unreacted. So um, a thioether is just an ether that has a sulfur instead of an oxygen. And so any of the ways that we have used before to synthesize ethers, we can also use those to synthesize thioethers. We just start with the sulfur equivalent of the alcohol. So we could do a Williamson ether synthesis, but instead of starting with an alcohol, we start with a thiol and we could deprotonate the thiol and have it attack an alkyl halide, for example. And that would give us a thioether, which is sometimes called a sulfide. Um, and another type of ether is called a silyl ether, which is just uh, an ether where one half of the ether has a silicon atom instead of a carbon. So if you look at the periodic table, you'll recognize that oxygen and sulfur are in the same family, and also that carbon and silicon are in the same family. So if we replace oxygen with a sulfur atom, we get a thioether. And if we replace one of the carbons with a silicon, we get a silyl ether. So these are just two molecules that are very similar to ethers and have similar kind of properties and similar synthesis. So here's an example of utilizing a Williamson ether synthesis for a sulfide. Uh, to create a, a thioether um, from a thiol. So the first step is not shown where we start with the, the thiol and then we would use an appropriate base to deprotonate the thiol and then that would turn uh, this into a thiolate which is a strong nucleophile even stronger than an alkoxide um, and the thiolate will attack the appropriate alkyl halide in this case one bromopropane. So then we could put uh, a different, we could put a different you know chain on the other side of the sulfur group so we'd have one side that was already bonded to the the thiol in this case an, an ethane an ethyl group and if we attack bromopropane then the other side is going to be a propyl group so we'd have ethyl propyl sulfide um, here is the same synthesis again and we can see that uh, in the bottom reaction, notice how the stereochemistry becomes inverted. Um, and we would expect this because that, sol that thiolate ion is um, a strong nucleophile and we have a primary electrophile. So this mechanism is just an SN2 mechanism and SN2 mechanisms always proceed with inversion of stereochemistry. 
So we'll see that if we start with an R configuration on that stereo center, that after the SN2 mechanism occurs, we will end up with an S configuration, uh, which is indicative of the backside attack of that nucleophile. The nucleophile will come from the opposite side of the bromide, and so then if the bromide is in the front, then our nucleophile, the sulfide in this case, is going to be in the back. Um, so that's, that's pretty much all we're going to say about thioethers. This is just a simple way to replace oxygen with sulfur, create a, a sulfur version of an ether. Um, now we'll, look, we'll move on to the silyl ethers, and silyl ethers are used differently. Um, they're not just a molecule that we might want to synthesize um, as our, our target molecule that we use them in uh, a strategic way in order to protect a functional group. So let's see what a protecting group is. So this, these next couple of slides will show us how we utilize these silyl ethers. So um, imagine we have this starting molecule on the left, which has a ketone and an alcohol attached to that cyclopentane ring. If we want to attack the ketone with an organometallic reagent, like a Grignard reagent, as shown here, what we want to have happen is to have that uh, Grignard reagent attack the carbonyl um, and leave us with a tertiary alcohol. However, what's actually going to happen in this case is the Grignard reagent is just going to deprotonate the alcohol. We mentioned this when we talked about organometallics earlier which is that they are incompatible with protons. An organometallic reagent is a very strong base, and if there's any acidic proton in the molecule, then the organometallic is just going to attack the acidic proton instead of the electrophilic carbon, for example. Um, and so what we would want to have happen is deliver that phenyl group to the carbonyl, but as we see, that's X'd out. That's not what occurs in this reaction. What occurs instead is the Grignard just attacks the alcohol and deprotonates. So how can we avoid that? Well, one way that we could avoid that, as we, I mentioned this last chapter when we were talking about this, we want to hide the H. If the H is the problem, if that acidic proton is the problem and it's going to get attacked instead of the atom that we want to attack with our group, then we just have to hide the H, for example. So if we convert the alcohol to an ether instead, then we don't have that acidic proton anymore. And if we don't have that acidic proton, then the Grignard will do what we want it to do, which is attack the carbonyl compound. So um, we can convert the alcohol to an ether, do the reaction where we want to avoid the acidic proton, and then reconvert that ether back to an alcohol if ultimately the, the molecule that we want has an alcohol in it. We can't do the reaction that we're looking to do, this Grignard reaction, we can't do it when the alcohol is still present. So we have to convert the alcohol to an ether, and then convert the, the, do the reaction we want, and then convert the ether back to an alcohol would be one strategy to do this. The issue is, it's difficult to convert an ether back into an alcohol. That's, as we just saw, if we try to convert an ether to an alcohol, uh, it's going to keep reacting and it will leave us with an alkyl halide, for example, or an alkene or something else. Um, we can convert an alcohol to an ether relatively easy with the Williamson ether synthesis, but then converting the ether back into an alcohol is not an easy reaction to do. So often, instead of just using a regular ether for this process, we'll end up using a silyl ether as a protecting group, but the strategy is the same. So if we start with an alcohol, and we use this molecule here that's called TIPS chloride, which is chlorotriisopropyl silane, um, it's got these three isopropyl groups bonded to a silicon in the middle and a, a chlorine atom. The chloride is going to serve as a leaving group, and uh, we're just going to initiate an SN2 mechanism here, whereby that uh, triethylamine is going to deprotonate our alcohol. The alcohol, the alkoxide, will then attack the silicon atom, carbon will leave, and we'll put this silicon group, this TIPS ether, this TIPS group, where the H was. So 
This is very similar to what we saw when we were doing tosylation. Remember when we did a, a when we used a tosylate, we could use tosic acid to remove that H and replace it with a tosyl group, thereby making the the OH into an OTS, which is a good leaving group, which then makes it a substrate for a substitution reaction. That's essentially what we're doing here. We use a base, we use this um, electrophile that has a good leaving group, and we replace the H with the silicon containing group, what we call a, a silyl ether. And then, the, the, this is the trick, it's actually easier to remove that silyl ether if we use um, this tetrabutyl uh, ammonia fluoride group that we see above the arrow there, and we can remove that silyl ether and put the H back on fairly easily. So it's difficult to convert a carbon-containing ether back to an alcohol, but it's easy to convert a silicon-containing ether back to an alcohol. So here's that reaction again, and here's how we would utilize that mechanism. We would start with our the molecule that has an alcohol, and the first step would be protecting that alcohol. So we'd use TIPS chloride and triethylamine. Triethylamine is just a base in this case. It removes the proton to make that alkoxide a stronger electrophile, a stronger nucleophile. We put we synthesize the silyl ether then we don't have that acidic proton anymore on the alcohol, so we can perform a Grignard reaction. So the second step is our Grignard reaction. We have our phenyl magnesium bromide there as a Grignard that delivers our phenyl group to the carbonyl. Um, and then in the next step, we could, de we could remove that silyl ether using tetrabutyl ammonia fluoride, which would, uh, which would bring reconvert that ether back to an alcohol. And we call that deprotected. So essentially, one way of looking at this is that we have an alcohol and we have to protect the alcohol. So we protect the alcohol with a silyl ether, and then we can deprotect after we've done the reaction that's incompatible with alcohols. We deprotect, and then the alcohol comes back. 